Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this session of Green Week, which is devoted to the topic of protected areas for social inclusion and economic recovery. Um, we will have many debates during Green Week in relation to the role of protected areas. And first and foremost, they are a key tool in relation to the protection of areas of high value for nature and they are central to the recovery of, of nature. So it is ultimately space for nature. But in Europe, we recognize that protected areas not only provide space for nature, they provide multiple benefits to society. And we estimated them in Natura, the EU-wide network of protected areas to be worth at least two to 300 billion euros per year. And that includes very significant benefits linked to tourism, which generate economic benefits to the uh, communities in and around the protected areas. We also increasingly recognize that protected areas are a key tool in terms of the social inclusion and the health of communities that live in and around protected areas. And organizations like Europark are now talking about, you know, the health um, dimension where doctors say, instead of giving you a tablet, they tell you to, they give you a prescription to go for a walk in nature. And these green spaces uh, in and around our cities are critical. And never has this been more obvious than during the COVID uh, outbreak that we are now living through, that people are restricted in terms of their movements and having green spaces and protected areas near where we live is so valuable in terms of our health and our well mental well-being. So we are convinced in the European Commission that protected areas provide these benefits and we want to maximize them. We see that in the context of the recovery that's set out in the framework of the New Green Deal that the European Commission is promoting, that we need to have a green recovery that is also inclusive, leaving nobody behind. So we have to see that. So therefore, this session is really trying to explore with different experts bringing a rich experience in relation to protected areas and social inclusion and um, economic recovery as to the opportunities and the challenges that this presents in the context of our policies for the years to come. My name, by the way, is Michal O'Brien. I'm the deputy head of the Nature Unit. And obviously we are very concerned about making progress on protected area management across the European Union. And I'm very fortunate to be joined by four experts that will bring their experience in relation to this subject. There will be a chance for participants to ask questions. There is a question um, facility um, that you can pose questions and we will try and address them um, in the context of the, 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 the time that we have. That's not the same as using the chat facility, which is a separate matter. We will not benefit from seeing your exchange on the chat. So you have to go to the question uh, function. So, um, and I think that there are different language facilities that are available to you if you want to listen in different languages um, in terms of interpretation. So please be aware of that facility as well. So without further ado, maybe we could move to the first presentation and that's by Karina Venstrom, who is a specialist in working on recreation and nature tourism in Metsähallitus in uh, Finland. Metsähallitus is a very, very significant organization dealing with the national parks and wildlife in Finland. And they have a rich experience in terms of not only protecting nature, but providing access to nature for people. So maybe over to you, Karina, to share with your, us your, your experience on this subject. Thank you. Yes, good day to you all. <clears throat> My name is Karina Wenström and I am the 
working for Metsähallitus, Parks and Wildlife Finland, as we call it in English. My presentation is about how to connect people and nature through our healthy parks, healthy people strategy, and thereby increasing health and well-being uh, in the protected areas. Next slide, please. Uh, Metalitus manages all the state-owned uh, areas, research for nature conservation and hiking in Finland. Here you can see that we have about 40 national parks, we have 19 strict nature reserves, 5 national hiking areas and 12 wilderness areas in Lapland, which are rather uh, big. And then, of course, over 3,000 other protected areas and cultural heritage sites. But uh, in addition to this nature conservation, they are also important for recreation and uh, tourism. So in these areas, we have over 5,000 kilometers of maintained trails, and we have nearly one and a half thousand uh, campfire sites. Next slide, please. This graph shows that the visitation to Finnish national parks has been increasing significantly over the two past decades. It should, of course, be noted that also the national park network has increased over the years, but the increase in visitation, shown by the orange line, has been even stronger. Last year we had some 3.2 million visits to Finnish national parks, which is quite a lot when we have a population of about bit more than 5 million. Next, please. And then this COVID pandemic has this year brought the visitation to even higher levels. And uh, all around, people are increasingly searching and finding health and well-being from nature during this strange time when so many other activities are limited. In Finland, for instance, there has been a 20% increase to national park visitation from January to July this year, compared to last year's January to July. The biggest increase has been in southern Finland. In Lapland, there has been a small decrease. Next slide, please. Our task is, though, to manage these areas for the benefit of people and nature. In order to meet these goals, we have established a Healthy Parks, Healthy People program for Finland some 10 years ago. And this year, Europe Park Federation has launched a European-wide Healthy Parks, Healthy People program. The aim of the program is to inspire people to get out and exercise in the natural environment more often and for longer periods of time. On the background of the Healthy Parks, Healthy People idea is a win-win situation. People get more green exercise and all the benefit from it, while at the same time they'll hopefully get more connected to nature and thus understand the value of nature protection and nature conservation. Next, please. Uh, projects has been the most important way of implementing this Healthy Park, Healthy People program in Finland. We have had several projects related to promoting health and well-being, with emphasize on equal access. We have had projects focusing on developing various nature-based interventions, as well as projects focusing on rehabilitation and integration. Most of these projects has been implemented with the European Regional Development Fund or the European Social Fund. Both are EU's, EU's structural funds. As a national agency, we have been, then been able to replicate successful projects in different regions, together with partners, of course, thus creating a long-lasting effect in different regions. Some of these projects have web pages in English, and though in those cases, links are provided here in this presentation. In this presentation, uh, the time doesn't allow us to dwell in 
to this, but all in all, I would like to say that with these EU projects, we have been able to make a difference. We have been able to increase green exercise in Finland. And next, please. Then the main aim, I'd like to conclude with this, the main aim of the Healthy Parks, Healthy People program to inspire people to go out into nature and to exercise for, for longer periods or more and more often. And through that, they will gain health and well-being effects. They'll hopefully get connected to nature and thus understand the value of nature conservation. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Karina, and you were perfectly on time. <laughs> so that's a, a bonus. Um, and of course, there were some really important messages there in terms of the fundamental message of healthy parks, uh, healthy people. And I know that Finland will have inspired a wider European reflection through Europark and other organizations in relation to the work that you and colleagues um, have been doing. And of course, I'm really pleased to see that the European funds, the structural funds have been able to support the work that you're doing, because I think this is a really uh, important investment in terms of the socio-economic dimension of, of, of nature. Um, so we'll maybe come back to some of those points in, in, in the discussion, but if I could move on to the next speaker, and uh, that's Sandra Leros Comensania, Comensania. excuse Comensania. me, by my Spanish, my Galician is not very good. Uh, Sandra is from uh, Spain, Galicia and Spain. I understand she works in a transport company, but her passion is nature. And she will bring a perspective of youth in terms of um, a life project. And this is another EU fund that obviously can be put to good use for exactly. this purpose. And she's also been involved with the European Solidarity Corps, which was set up mm -hmm. to provide opportunities for volunteerism for, for the youth. So with your perspective, uh, Sandra, the floor is yours to share your experience with us, please. Okay, sure. Uh, so I think Sofia is going to share the, the screen for me. I think so. Yes, Sandra, shall I try to put on the video first? Are you going to do it? I will try. I can try. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So we will start with a short video. Very short. Let's see if it works. Over to you, Sandra. Okay. So are, are you going to share the PowerPoint now as well? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm doing it. And please yeah. uh, try to speak loud because we get uh, comments from the participants that they have difficulty to hear us. Thank you. 
Okay, can you hear me properly? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, good. So yeah, while she's looking for the thing, I'm Sandra from Spain and I'm here to talk about our LEPO project, which uh, is, as Michael said, is a live uh, project. So this is the live Evergreen with Volunteers project. And uh, yeah, that's our website. Okay. And um, as we have registered a dramatic increase in melting glaciers, violent atmospheric phenomena and extreme temperature for the season, young people in Galicia, Spain, know that these indicators are the result of human activities. Institutions alone cannot solve the problem. And as never before, the participation of citizens is essential to conserving the environment. Help, the EU is promoting environmentally friendly policies and through concrete measures seeks to raise awareness and inform European citizens about the effects that climate change can have on their lives. The European Solidarity Corps is a European Union initiative which creates opportunities for young people to volunteer. The LIFE program is the EU's funding instrument for the environment and climate action. In Galicia, Spain, the regional government, through the Directorate General for Youth Participation and Volunteering, in collaboration with the Directorate General for Natural Heritage, has launched the LIFE Evergreen with Volunteer Project under the LIFE Financial Element and the European Solidarity Corps program. Our objectives are to contribute to reducing the impact that human action has on natural heritage, make the use of natural resources sustainable, promote environmental education and citizen participation in the care of nature. And uh, what we do, uh, young volunteers will develop actions of protection, preservation, awareness, and maintenance within the natural habitats of Nat Natura 2000 network and special areas of bird protection in Galicia. The task that would that were carried out in those areas were to clean up, signposting, cataloging flora and fauna, combating exotic species. Okay, if you go next. How? Um, through a model of participation in which young people living in Galicia come to feel linked to the space that offers the resources in order to contribute to a better conservation. Each volunteer must be registered at European Solidarity Corps. Once registered, the volunteer must contact the organization. They send through the PASS platform the invitation to participate in the LEVO project, and the volunteer must agree to participate in the activities and is, and is included in the list of volunteers. The organization schedules activities and each person enrolls in the activities they wish. For each group of volunteers, there is a mentor who will guide and support the group. The activities take place on weekends, from Friday till Sunday, and volunteers can be from anywhere in Galicia. On Fridays, there is a training prior to each activity, and training is about the project, its objectives, and expected results. And on Saturdays and Sundays, the whole group does file work. The tasks that we do, uh, Sofia, I don't know if you can advance. No? Yeah. Oh, I'm missing some, some of the slides. Well, whatever. The task that, that uh, we do is um, cleaning and maintenance of areas to prevent fires and degradation and to improve access accessibility. Catalog of the species, fauna and flora present in the territory including those invasive exotics. Talk to visitors in the areas and visits to fire zones with the scholars' children. And well, this year uh, we had the COVID-19, so um, those were the effects and change um, that uh, we needed to do. Uh, we had 21 council activities between March and July, and now the maximum is for 10 volunteers in each group. Each participant had to sign a statement of health conditions. Uh, we are using uh, permanent masks. Uh, the meals are in small groups and in open places. And the accommodations are with safety distance. Um, the data were, uh, the total weekends with activities were 62, and we have another days 
which were 29. The total participants were 939, uh, which 38 of them were people with functional diversity, which I need to say that uh, I was able to be with them one weekend, which was really, really nice. Uh, we had uh, 70 scholars children, 215 hours of training, of direct training, and working groups in areas were uh, 852 hours. We have more of uh, 3,000 3, applications received and more than 30 different suppliers. And uh, well, this project, Life 16, uh, Life Evergreen with Volunteers level project, is possible thanks to the European Life Financial Instrument. So, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Sandra, for sharing that experience. I mean, it's an extremely rich experience of uh, an opportunity under the LIFE program, the European Solidarity Corps, for people, young people like yourself, to engage in practical work and to learn and train. And maybe we will come back in terms of that experience and how you would like to see it continued um, in, the, in the questions. Um, if I could move on to the next presentation, and that's by Alain uh, Salvi. And uh, Alain is president of the Conservatoire d'Espace Naturel de Lorraine in uh, France. Um, he, is, he has um, done this work in a voluntary capacity He's a retired lecturer from the University of Lorraine and uh, has a doctorate in biological sciences. And he's going to share with us um, his experience in the Grand Etang de la Chaussée, um, where there has been work with people with disability in terms of their engagement in conservation and, of course, the opportunities that give them for work as well. Over to you, Alain. A, I understand you will speak in French, and there is an interpretation facility if people are not aware of that already. Alain, please. Oui. <coughs> Merci beaucoup. Uh, Thank you very much. Indeed, I'm going to tell you about this experience of collaboration that we have conducted with an organization of protection of nature and of disabled people. This is something we're going to see in the next slide. Please, Sophia, move on. Thank you. So this is a Natura 2000 area, which is uh, uh, situated at the border with uh, Germany and Luxembourg. And so this is an important area, which is important for the promotion of uh, tourism. This area has been uh, uh, earmarked for conservation and protection. It's called Etang de la Chaussée, and which is extremely important for uh, birds, uh, which are migrating birds, and uh, for uh, nature, this is important. So we move on to the next slide, please. So you see the whole area around the lake or the pond is uh, 3,500 hectares which is part of an area, Ramsar, which is twice as large. And so we have this particular pond, which has enabled disabled people to engage in several activities. Next slide, please. So you see a bird's eye view of this large pond called La Chaussée. And you see the village here on the left-hand side. This is where we have a reception center for disabled people. Next slide, please. So this is a large area which was given in 1978 by a generous donator 
to a French association for disabled people called APS, uh, France France Handicap. So you can see this all happened in the 70s and uh, a few years later the APS decided uh, to set up a sheltered work-based support center. Um, so they work on job opportunities, uh, contributing to fishing, fishing processing, poultry catering and selling the produce of uh, uh, the fishing activity, uh, poultry raising and so on. However, this is difficult for the uh, disabled uh, people organization to manage that. They had to learn uh, those new trades, which is um, costly operation. Next slide, please. So on the next slide here, we see that this is wetland, this is pond, this means that you need to maintain the area and the cost involved is quite high. So uh, sometimes you need to empty the pond, so that means that you need to take care of the fish not easy and you needed to find funds to be able to coordinate that type of intervention in the past and in the future we will need to continue to benefit from nature 2000 and the regional nature reserve credits of course this draws on many tourists and many visitors but the financial situation has remained extremely delicate because of the costly nature of those um, uh, maintenance work. Next slide, please. Two years ago, because of the financial situation, France Handicap decided to sell the pond, but retain the possibility of using it so this was taken over by an organization and this is uh, the cost was uh, 3 million euros so it's not a small amount of money and many organizations of the Lorraine department um, uh, and especially management water management organizations intervened but also the european uh, regional uh, fund um, helped and so we were interested as conservatory of natural area areas of Lorraine to manage the estate so on to sum it up uh, France Handicap has retained the use of the site but um, it is the conservatory of natural areas that is managing um, all the technical aspects and the rural aspects as well. Next slide, please. And on this slide, you understand that the uh, Association of Disabled People has been able to expand its activities now that its financial worries were over, and they've been able to um, expand its traditional activities into a growing and selling aquatic plants and fighting against uh, invasive alien plants uh, that are often uh, an element which invades the ponds. Next slide. And so we now have a structure which is financially sound which can host disabled people the logo has changed the logo is just an image but it summarizes the fact that all of the activities involve uh, catering you can see the spoon and the fork you can see the fish fishing and uh, 
water activities. This was in 2020. Uh, there are 60 people working there. Among them, 40 are people with different disabilities. And this in a village where there are only 271 inhabitants. The whole estate now is really converting into organic production. Next. So to wrap up, we were able to protect in a sustainable way a unique uh, estate of France, unique nature and landscape area, preserve its harmonious development, taking into account the area and uh, with a view to including disabled people through work. And this also gives work to the inhabitants of the village. Thank you very much. Next. Thank, Thank you, Alain, for that Thank presentation. you very much. And bringing that dimension of how working for nature, if you do it in a very sensitive way, can also work for people including people with disabilities and that you get a win-win and obviously that's what we're trying to achieve. So that's a very important and and rich experience and I'm it's a long journey. It seems that this didn't happen overnight. It requires a lot of um, working with people, listening to people. So we may come back to that. Um, the final presentation is from Silvia Argentiero and Sylvia is um, a communication, social media, and press officer with Parco Nord Milano in Italy. She has a background in natural sciences and um, uh, also in environmental communication, a master's in that. And she deals with all these issues of communication that we need to do. And she's going to share with us a very interesting example in terms of working in an urban, peri-urban context, where obviously people have more access to these green spaces and how we can work in a community way to achieve these goals. Over to you, Sylvia, please. Exactly. Thank you, Michael. Well, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. I think now you can see my, my presentation. Good morning. Um, yes, I work uh, with communication at Parco Nord Milano. Uh, I deal with the um, dissemination of the projects and the initiatives of the park. So today is a pleasure to be here uh, to tell you about an important uh, um, project of social agriculture carried out at Parco Nord Milano. So just a few words about the park. Um, here you can see a part uh, of, of the park that is a, a very huge metropolitan park um, which rise on a peri-urban area of the city of Milan. Um, it was born 40 years ago uh, um, on um, an industrial area on abandoned and uncultivated lands. So, um, today uh, we have uh, around 800 and hectares of a protected area uh, of which 450 uh, are today um, green equipped lands. So today we have a very um, huge um, biodiversity in the park. So as you can see, uh, 100 hectares of native wood, uh, agriculture, fields, lakes, a uh, lot of species of mammals, insects, and, and so on. Um, so in this context, uh, Park Nord uh, Milano carry on um, different naturalization projects uh, and the cultural initiatives. Uh, and one of them is the communal garden Niguarda. Here you can see a picture of the um, uh, communal garden. Um, 
this project has been realized thanks to the, the good power of an agronomist of the park, Fabio Campana, and thanks to the um, important support of a um, no profit organization, Orto Comune Niguarda. And it, start, it started um, around six years ago on a 5,000 square meters field. And today we have uh, around 150 members per year of, um, that works uh, in, in the um, communal garden between citizens and volunteers. So uh, the communal uh, garden um, was one of the two principal aims, promoting a social cohesion, uh, using uh, the agriculture as tool in a very um, heterogeneous uh, population place. And uh, the second is um, promote uh, um, the diffusion of a sustainable lifestyle. Thank you, the um, organic farming and the self-production. Here you can see how is designed and divided our, our, our um, common garden. Um, we have different areas that we call rooms. Here you can see the aromatics was where people uh, can um, cultivate aromatic plants, uh, learn uh, to recognize them and how to use in the kitchen and how to cook them, for example. In the right picture, you can see um, the area, a part of the area of the garden therapy. Uh, that is very important to um, allow the, um, every, to everybody to work the soil, to cultivate, thanks to these uh, raised crops uh, and the space for the wheelchairs. And then we have other um, areas like synergical garden, apiculture, they produce honey, um, the part for ashen seeds, uh, and the mandala garden that you saw in the picture before, uh, where the farmers um, play with, with um, the green shades uh, and the shapes uh, and the colors of vegetables. So the um, uh, aesthetic is a very important aspect uh, of the, um, of the garden, because uh, we know that, when, that um, when people come into the garden, can feel uh, serenity and they can see the, um, to, 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 to be in a beautiful place. So what's happened during the lockdown? The communal garden garden didn't stop because we had um, the bees to take care and harvest the honey and uh, harvest the crop as well uh, to don't uh, uh, waste the food, of course. So respecting all the COVID laws, uh, the volunteers and our agronomists um, were authorized to enter in the garden during the lockdown and continue to harvest the crops and to distribute uh, um, the products and the food to poor family and, uh, and needy persons, because you know that in that period, that period we were restricted, so we couldn't go out of the grocery shopping, for example, people lost their jobs, so it wasn't, it was difficult to buy food. And so the volunteers uh, cooperated with um, groups active in the city during the health emergency uh, to collect food and distribute and give that to them to um, poor family. So after this experience, we have uh, a new challenge today uh, for the future. Um, indeed, uh, um, the communal garden Iguarda attend uh, a tender that was aimed to carry on uh, this experience, uh, this initiative uh, of help needy people uh, over the lockdown. Um, so they won this tender of the city of Milan, and now, in the end of this month, uh, they are launched the project on a crowdfunding platform. Um, it is useful to collect uh, the money to realize the uh, two greenhouses uh, that can help to extend uh, the cultivation period uh, in the wall here. So in the um, late autumn and early spring to uh, get products and to distribute uh, um, during the year to um, needy people. Uh, the second one challenge for the future is uh, um, 
replicate this best practice, uh, um, realizing another communal garden within the refugee shelter that we have in, uh, near the park in order to use the agriculture again uh, in favor of racial integration and social inclusion. So um, here, uh, just to conclude uh, um, some factors very significant for the projects. Uh, we have learned that cooperation uh, between more players is fundamental to ensure the continuity of uh, the vegetable gardens activities. And the two different aspects, uh, the workforce, but also the um, financing aspects to, to carry on the project. Um, agriculture, the second one is that ag agriculture is an effective tool for aggregation and social cohesion. We realized it was a, a good news, but it was a surprise that it works. And uh, in the end, we, uh, what we have got, um, disseminate a new approach to the nature and uh, um, their products that uh, in, for the um, people that live in urban, it's, it's not so, um, so easy and attract the interest of the quality of food. Because you know that uh, often um, the needy people uh, don't care about the quality of food because they, are, they pay attention to um, save money. Um, so maybe they don't care about the quality, the nutritional value, but thanks to the um, organic farming and the self-production, they learn um, new practices. So these are the, the, the challenges for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sylvia. That's extremely rich, that experience. And there are many, many interesting um, messages and lessons that you, you bring to, to, to the debate in the context of, of, of uh, that experience, in not only in terms of the local community, but you mentioned refugees as well. So this is a way of engaging people in a community and in a space and obviously, if you, if you, the more that people engage, the more they will appreciate and, and respect. Now, of course, the, 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 we will have some questions. And um, of course, if people want to ask questions or make a comment in relation to this topic, uh, they are welcome to do so. Um, maybe if I could set the debate going in terms of Coming back to the speakers, um, I see that you know each of you have looked at this uh, from a different perspective in terms of a wider community, healthy parks, healthy people, as as um, Karina said, um, the, the the youth, the volunteering, the engagement of people with disabilities and trying to get those benefits. And then the local community in an, an urban context, including in terms of refugees. Um, when you look back at a lot of it seems to be driven by projects. Um, is finance the critical issue? Is awareness, political support, or is it um, competing objectives? Would anybody like to say what they found to be the biggest obstacles? to progress or to making this more widely applied. So the, uh, maybe I ask each in turn um, to comment in terms of what you see as the biggest obstacles to achieving a greater success in the future. Karina. <clears throat> well, I guess funding is, is one important issue and uh, and of course, the political acceptance and the political awareness of the, the importance of the green area. Actually, actually, I think that this COVID uh, uh, epidemic has kind of helped us to to we have had really a big rush in our national parks, and also the the people deciding in the city has noticed how important the green areas are. But of course. Everything has to do with money. Yeah, and you've been very successful in, in, in using EU funds and I presume national funds 
as well. We, we are trying, yes. <laughs> well, that's good. And we're pleased to see that because we want the funds to be used to actually have a green recovery. And this is also a critical dimension in terms of tapping into the EU funds. Um, so can I ask Cassandra in terms of, you know, you have actually got this uh, wonderful experience, but um, where, I mean, you've been a volunteer. Do you see this as creating further opportunities for young people to engage and what would yeah, you sure. to strengthen Yeah, sure, people? definitely. It's, it's a great opportunity for people, everybody that uh, I know um, being volunteers as, as myself. All of them were like really happy, like um, all of us, we were like, oh, this is a really good opportunity for us because uh, in the project you are able to, um, as we are together for a whole weekend from Friday till Sunday, we share time together and we feel uh, good with ourselves because we feel like we are doing something great for nature, for the community. So we will, we feel uh, good about that. And um, I don't know if you know Galicia, but if you, you know, if you don't know it, uh, I invite you to come here and visit visit it because it's um, it's uh, beautiful. So um, lots of the places where I've been participating, some of them I know them before, but um, another places I I haven't been there before. So it was a good opportunity for me because I was able to to know these places here in in Galicia. And as well, I met lots of people. So for me, as a volunteer, uh, it was the, the the experience was amazing. I I can't say anything bad about the experience. But for the future, what would you like to see in terms of more support for youth engagement in the nature recovery agenda? What what were the big things that we need to support do? Support from from the organization, or I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, well, I mean, obviously, you have had this good and rich experience. Mm -hmm. But if we are to have a an economic recovery, because a lot of young people are unemployed, um, yeah. how should we work to engage better the young people in this nature recovery agenda? Is it to have more life projects? Is it to to make sure that the management of protected areas uh, has this inclusive dimension, what would you like to see? Yeah, I would like to have more uh, life projects. All of the people that I met there, all of uh, us, we were like, well, we hope that uh, as this project now is finishing now, we hope that uh, we can have another life project, not the same one, but uh, maybe another one similar uh, where we could uh, repeat these actions. Uh, but I mean, I'm not sure what you could do uh, more. I mean, mm, I don't know. The project is great. So just have another project. I don't know. Not sure what, what else I can say. Mm, okay, I don't know. but it's, 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 it's good that you, you see the value of the life program in terms yeah, of... Yeah, definitely. Of yeah, 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 sure. And maybe that's something that we need to explore more. Hmm. Uh, Alain, um, in terms of the, you seem to have overcome obstacles and you clearly have, you know, worked into creating a more uh, sustainable financial model uh, with the Conservatoire taking the overall management of the area. You also had a, uh, what I interest, was interested in, this idea of a, a label, an organic uh, kind of product label to valorize the products coming from from the area what would be your experience in terms of how we can build and learn from this uh, practical example to greater success in the future oui oui il y a sans doute uh... Well, yes, there are certainly several lessons that we can draw. I tried to present in a matter of a few minutes something that took us 40 years. 40 years is what it took to create a climate of trust between an, a social organization and an environmental 
protection organization. I believe that we now have harmonious and well-balanced relations. What I would wish for would be to have financial support at the origin, because the financial balance is always extremely delicate for disabled people's organization because of the disabilities. Uh, the cost of production is always higher than what you would have with valid workers. And so this financial support is a basic support. Maybe it's more the social fund uh, um, compared to the other existing funds, but we need to have sustainable financial support. For instance, during the COVID, we had a lockdown in France too. And so for several weeks, we had no visitors. No one came to buy the fish. No one came to um, eat at the restaurant. So all of the things that we managed to do and that was successful at the end of last year was compromised this year because of COVID. And so again, it was the financial support that was uh, the key element. And like Sandra said, the life projects are good, but they are particularly difficult to organize or manage. Maybe that's because we're French and we're not good at it, but um, uh, when they do work, they are extremely successful and uh, yes. can bring well, in many for, things for, to be for, leveraged. For of course, the life program is a hugely um, va valuable um, program for, for supporting nature and engaging people. But as you said, it's not an easy fund to get uh, support under because it's a high quality standard and also quite competitive. Um, but I think it is it does expand in the next period and hopefully there will be more opportunities to bring this dimension in terms of investing not only in recovery of nature, but engagement of people in, in, in terms of that. Um, Sylvia, what, what do you think in terms of your experience? You said that, you know, that obviously it has been successful in getting community engagement. Um, have the authorities in Milan been fully behind you? Is this seen to be a, a big public project or do the authorities kind of let you get on with the work without fully supporting you? Would you like to see more support from the authorities or how does it work? Yeah. So um, it starts from um, with power of the park, uh, that is a um, public entities, but um, Mm, it was an initiative uh, of um, the Park Nord Milano and um, to support this experience uh, um, was founded also a um, non-profit organization, Orto Comune Niguarda, that is an association that uh, mm, together with our agronomists uh, carry on the, the, the projects thanks to the volunteers. But uh, um, the project needs uh, public funding, you know, to, um, for example, have uh, a person, well, for the vegetable materials, for example, um, for the maintenance, but also to have uh, uh, a fixed presence that can coordinate all the activities and that can be um, always on, on, on the site. Um, to cover all the shifts of the, of the volunteers. So um, it's very um, important uh, attend to tenders and the public funding. After um, the uh, lockdown experience, um, the, the volunteers uh, and the association worked and cooperated to get together other um, groups uh, um, active during the health emergency. And um, this was a, so a best experience uh, um, that worked very good. And so uh, they decided to um, attend another tender. Um, so this is a tender of a 
city of Milan. So in this case, uh, uh, the city of Milan uh, um, gives some contribution, uh, a contribution to all these uh, realities uh, to uh, carry on the projects. Um, so in this case, it's fundamental uh, the presence of, um, of public entities. Um, of course, uh, the contribution can, mm, uh, we, we need to, to gain contribution also from the, uh, um, and the attention of these uh, um, teams, uh, also from the, the governments, because uh, if they, for example, cut um, the investment for immigrants, uh, uh, we can't uh, access to, to the public uh, uh, funding for uh, uh, these um, kind of people. Uh, you have to know that uh, the neighborhoods where the um, Orto Comune um, Niguarda, the, the communal garden, uh, raised is in a um, suburban area, and uh, we have uh, lots of uh, um, uh, immigrants uh, and um, people of, from different background, different culture, different age uh, and background. So um, it's fundamental at this part of attention from the government and uh, uh, the commons. Thank you. I mean, no, that, that, that really is important that there is the support from public authorities because a lot of the initiatives are bottom up. They are community initiatives. But of course, in terms of the public authorities to recognize and to support them. Sophia Pascini, my colleague who organized this event, um, are there any other questions, Sophia, that, or do you want to make a comment yourself in relation before I wrap up the session? Because unfortunately, we're coming to the end. Yes, Miho, we have no questions, but I would like to come in and uh, make a comment myself. So I would like just to, to bring an example of what happened in Europe uh, back in 2003 when you had the big heat waves. And then in, in four months, it was around 70,000 people that lost their lives because of the extreme heat waves in the cities. And at that moment, the city authorities recognized, first of all, the risk of high temperatures, but also they recognized also the, the value of nature and um, the possibilities that it offers. In, in that case. And since then, they now we have like climate adaptation plans for cities. We have different initiatives that they have become mainstream. So now we are we are in COVID. And the question, the big question mark is, is it going to be a catalyst again, which will help the, that we the authorities and the cities and the regions recognize the value of the nature and this would also help in the funding because as we saw, many of the initiatives were funded under the structural funds and we really need this collaboration. So I think this is my, my comment or. No, I think that's a very valuable insight in terms of saying the value of these spaces, even in a climate change, you know, we're, we're living through a COVID crisis, but there is a climate crisis, a biodiversity crisis and um, we're going to have difficulties post-COVID in terms of the economic challenge. And it has to be a green recovery that benefits nature and people. So I think I have to bring this to a close in terms of the fact that, you know, we talk about our biodiversity strategy. It's about nature. It's about people. It's about climate, it's about the economy. And I think the examples that you gave us today uh, that we had with from Karina, Sandra, Alain and uh, Sylvia show different dimensions that can be achieved if we invest in protected areas and green spaces near our cities, in our cities, but also in our countryside and the COVID crisis really brought that home to us that people for their mental and physical well-being and a lot of people have been under steep stress in terms of the 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 constraints on their movement and um, that these spaces are vital for health and 
they provide huge opportunities as we move forward in terms of an economic recovery should also be one that is a green recovery that brings people with us. So your examples that you shared today, I mean, demonstrate at a grassroots level and a strategic level in Finland that you can design approaches that are good for nature and good for people. And I think we need to raise more awareness about that because in the post, in this recovery period, there will be competition for funding, for investment in the recovery. And I think the more we demonstrate the relevance of social inclusion, that these spaces provide multiple benefits, they also provide climate benefits as, 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 as Sophia has demonstrated, um, that then we can make a stronger argument to have access to the EU, to the national funds, and that we can demonstrate that this is a very beneficial agenda for the communities that live in and around. We didn't go into the big issue of tourism as well, because obviously there is a further dimension of tourism that's generated and provides local benefits as well, but also challenges, and that's another debate in itself. So I would like to draw this session to a close by thanking each of the speakers for sharing their experience with us. It's not the end of a debate, it's the start of the debate. In many cases, it's a debate that's ongoing with organizations like Europark, Eurosight, um, IUCN, and many others that are concerned by protected areas that we want to make them work for nature and work for people. So I thank all the speakers for participating today. I would like to thank Sophia Pashini again for organizing this event. And I would um, hope that uh, people will continue to participate in Green Week. Obviously, there are many different dimensions to the biodiversity challenge um, so that we actually are better equipped as we move forward to face this in the coming decades. So thank you again and uh, good luck for the future. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks to you.